God has a lot of invitations for us every single day. And they're all awesome. And the ones that he's put before me were, they seem wild, like saying yes to Survivor. You know, designing shoes for Puma when I didn't really study designing shoes in college. Or getting on The View and talking about these hot topics for 10 years with Barbara Walters. Or all of a sudden jumping into delivering live television news, like real news, not opinion news, in the morning, every day. Those were all things and invitations that were pretty scary at times. And I faced a little bit of fear along the way. And I think when God's presented those big things to me, I think he knows me specifically well, fully, to know that um, I have an obedient heart for him. I just do. I've always kind of wanted to do right by God. I, it's just the way I'm wired. We all have those moments where we need a little encouragement to get through our day. Someone to remind us that we are not alone. Find peace. Embrace joy. Seek God daily. Welcome to Jesus Calling Stories of Faith. Our guest is former talk show host and writer Elizabeth Hasselbeck. Hasselbeck rose to prominence as a contestant on the second season of the American version of Survivor, where she finished in fourth place. She went on to marry NFL quarterback Tim Hasselbeck in 2002 and joined the daytime talk show The View. During her time there, she won a daytime Emmy Award for Outstanding Talk Show Host, along with her co-hosts Joy Behar, Whoopi Goldberg, Sherry Shepard, and Barbara Walters. After 10 years on the show, she went on to join Fox and Friends. Elizabeth shares about her departure from Fox and some of the difficult moments she experienced during these seasons of change, and how she learned to wait for God's guidance as he continues to reveal her unique purpose in the world. I'm Elizabeth Hasselbeck, um, former, I guess, television, broadcast, talk, TV show host. <laughs> whatever that title was, um, blessing along the way to, to do that. And now currently enjoying the season as CBO, Chief Breakfast Officer in our home, and um, just enjoyed a real writing season that came unexpectedly in the quiet of taking some time off. Um, mom of three awesome kids who know the Lord and wife to an incredible husband. So we grew up family of four, my mom, my dad, my brother, Ken, myself. It was just an awesome creative home. My dad, he's an architect, brilliant man, um, and really instilled like a confidence in us to just try anything. And my mom um, just had an awesome reverence to her always. And um, she worked so hard in all that she did. Um, she's an attorney by trade and they're just great parents. I think that they just, um, raised us really well to be individual thinkers and loving, caring people. Like they really, I think, trained our eyes as we grew to see other people well and to feel um, other people. And so they just grew our hearts really well and provided the soil for that. Um, and I grew up in a Catholic home, so I grew up a lot of the times at my grandmother's house um, after school. Uh, my papa um, went to heaven when I was in about third grade and so my grandmother lived alone, so to keep her company, and also she helped my parents when they were working by picking us up after school sometimes, and spent a lot of time with Mama, and Mama was just devoted to prayer. She prayed, when, when she wasn't cooking, she was praying. When she wasn't pulling things out of her garden, she was praying. And so I just grew up knowing that prayer was um, not something for one time a day, but something that was essential all times of day. I always felt like a really tender, special relationship with God. Like I remember always praying, so it wasn't something that was foreign to me for whatever reason. Um, I knew what prayer was. I woke up and see what, I would see my grandmother praying in the day. And um, we just had a, and I'm thankful for it, we had a reverence um, that was trained up growing up. So I always knew the greatness of God. And I think I, learned the grace of God later on. So that was something that um, 
like I said, was just unlocked early. I knew what prayer looked like, and I knew what prayer looked like in some tough situations. And my dad had this really optimistic faith as well. And you know, my mom's probably more vocal. My dad is a little more quiet. Um, so I got to see different ways that faith could um, articulate itself. And, um, but my parents were such encouragers. I mean, they just kind of thought, what, if you work hard at something, you can do this. And they, they saw us with godly eyes. You know, they really saw us with the lens of like, you were created for something, let's go figure out what that is and go do it. And my dad was so encouraging. I remember when I was going to college um, at Boston College and I played softball in high school and he said, why don't you just bring your glove and try out for the team? And I thought, dad, you are so crazy. You know, kind of a little leftover teendom in me. And he said, I said, they don't even know my name. You know, this is a division one team. They don't know who I am. They don't know my name. And I don't, I honestly didn't believe that I could do it. And he looked at me and he said, I know who you are, I see you. I know who you are and I know what you can do. Go show them and run fast. <laughs> and so I got there and I was like, mainly to make them happy. Um, I packed my glove and my backpack on the way to school and he dropped me off and I just kind of looked at him. And then when tryouts came, I called the coach and I asked when they were really to honor my dad. He gave me a gentle reminder again. Um, and I tried out and it was only because he saw me and as a dad said, I see you, I know who you are, go show them. Um, did I have the confidence and encouragement to go do it? And I think that's what God as our father does all the time. You know, it just gave me this glimpse of what God says to us. Like, God's like, I know you, I see you, go show them. <laughs> and it's so, it was so loving and fatherly and it really launched me to have a family right away in college. I ended up making the team. I'm like. I made the team, I wasn't even gonna try out. You know, and then all of a sudden I had a, a locker, my name on it, jersey. I was like, I am on the team. I mean, I was like a bench warmer on the team, but because my dad let me see that I was seen, it just, it gave me the confidence to go do what I was created to do. And it was awesome. Now, I've got a great work ethic because my parents exemplified that for me and a great heart for the bigger, I love being part of a team. So I will do anything to not let the team down. And that's kind of how I operate. Sometimes your words can get ahead of the spirit. You know, there's danger in that. There's not a ton of room for the Holy Spirit to do what the Holy Spirit does best if you don't leave it room. And so in a live television environment, which I was in for almost 15 years, um, there's a lot of room to mess up and to say something, maybe that wasn't as soft as you could have said it, I think my proudest moments are the days that I could go home and say, God, did I please you? Did I stand up for you? Did I, did I share with somebody that you're who I rely upon um, in those tough days? I've had a lot of opportunities to sit with extraordinary people who've done really wildly successful things. Um, and those are always instructive moments for me to see like the personal side of someone who's had such progress in life. and and just productivity. Sometimes I think those, the failure moments for me were articulated in a way that maybe put more about what I stood for above the God I stood under. And I think that can get challenging because you want to, I think Bob Goff says like, God does not need you as his attorney. And he's been such an instructor to me and a teacher to me. I think there are sometimes I can look back and be like, man, did I spend that whole morning defending God instead of just being loving? I think having the chance to step away from broadcasting and 10 years where I was in a hot debate every day. They were not easy issues. The women that I sat there with at The View, um, we took on topics that you weren't supposed to talk about. And that was tricky. And I think there were some times that I feel like, gosh, did I use, was I too sharp in that? Could they really see Jesus through me? Or was I just defending this God that I knew? And so now having stepped back from all of that and the pressure, and pressure can make you do a couple of things. It can make you run away or it can make you charge forward. I think sometimes I charge forward with such fight. Okay, so for 10 years at The View, for example, I got really good at being right. I was like a rightaholic. I was like, whoo, I was right about that. They were wrong. <laughs> and like, roll tape. Um, and so because I practiced that, even in my personal life, you, you can start to get addicted to being right about things. And I don't think that's what God's asking us. God just wants us to be with people and wants us to be, I think, 
praying that we're wrong enough to be right with one another. Like that's kind of where I am now. Like, God, I hope I'm wrong enough. I hope we leave a little more room than I have in the past to be wrong enough so that I can be right with the people that you have right before me. I, I'm, I'm sure that's what he's asking me. So I think understanding someone's point of view requires being next to them and with them and just kind of like snuggling up behind their lens. And I thought that was the most fun thing about what I got to do every day. And so I, I started thinking about that a little bit more and with the title of the book, if I was so trained in getting behind the lens, like what lens am I looking at through? What lens do I see through every day? You know, the title of the book is called Point of View. And if you've ever studied broadcasting or been a part of it or watched something on TV, you know that as the person who's interviewing your job, so my job was to get behind the lens of the person telling the story. You get to tell their story best. If you get the blessing to, sh to look at someone's story and tell it, man, that's awesome. But what it requires to do it well and fully is to really get behind their lens. And then when you're talking about an issue, we all see things differently. And so I can see things my way, which with that trained muscle of being right can seem pretty right. Or I can try to see something the way somebody else sees it. And then ultimately I really wanna see myself, my circumstances, everyone around me in life through God's lens. And the only way to see through God's lens is through his word. And so he gives us by the gift of his Holy Spirit and his living, breathing word, this awesome lens to look through. And honestly, once you train your eye to look through that lens, like I really don't wanna look at another one. That's the best, most broad, clear lens out there. And so that's kind of where the book came from after, after really trying to see the point of view and deliver a point of view on topics, I thought, man, there's one that's just so good. And I will say, people sometimes look at the view and they're like, those women are crabbing at each other or they're just at each other. And I'm like, listen, we operated like a family. We just didn't do that and go away. We came back the next day. So underneath all of the debates that we have there and had there, their relationships, like Whoopi and I, this shocks everybody, Whoopi and I are friends, like dear friends, and I love her. We think nothing alike, but we love a lot alike. And I think she's been an awesome blessing in my life because we're not trying to change the other person's opinions, we're just loving each other well. God lets you overlap with people sometimes, it's by no mistake. Like he really wants you to just be near those people in whatever way you can. I'm so thankful for Candace. She has been such a dear friend it brought me such joy knowing that she was gonna be at The View um, when I was no longer there. It was almost like God being like, see? Because oftentimes it gives you the what before the why. And you're like, why? I want the why to justify the what, but the what's happening, you know? And so you're like, I'm like, why am I leaving? Well, when Candace got there, I'm like, this is a why, you know? I'm so thankful that she's there. And so in the process of writing, like the project that was being written and the message that, um, was being delivered was really just God wanting all of me and all of my heart and more of my heart that I'd given him before. And the process of writing this did that. He had some work to do in my heart. And so it's like, all right, God, if you ask me to do this, then I'm gonna do it. I'm just gonna trust you're gonna lead me through it. And it was a day of surrender. Like I have to constantly surrender again because I wasn't really sure that my story had a value. And I had this day where it's like, listen, if I created you, God says, and if I have a story in you, would you ever tell someone sitting across from you that their story had no value or worth and that God's work in their heart wasn't as important as somebody else's or unique? Like, everyone has one. I'd actually encourage everyone just write down where you've been and where you've seen God in it because it's like, he's there. He just wants you to see it. And so for me, it was just casting out that fear that this just wasn't gonna be what someone thought it would be and it would let somebody down or it wasn't enough. We'll be back with more of our interview with Elizabeth Hasselbeck after a brief message about a beautiful new edition of Jesus Calling. Share his love. Share his inspiration. Share his strength. Share his joy. the 
peace found in His presence. Jesus Calling Elizabeth continued her path through broadcasting, becoming a co-host for television's Fox and Friends. She candidly shares about the tough decision to move on from her broadcasting career into a new season of her life, and the difference between giving up on your dreams or giving them over to God. I believe that God met me at Fox, but I do believe that I kind of went ahead of his blessing and sort of sought it out for myself. And he was so good to me. He put awesome people waiting there for me. He knew I was going to like you know, ask him for his blessing as I was like rounding third, stealing home, trying to get a job to prove to the last place that had me that didn't want me anymore that I still had value. But I was working so hard to not let anybody down and do the job so well that I was over exhausting myself in that one area because I didn't feel like I should be there. And I wish I would have rested more in that. I wish I would have um, had more confidence in that area, but that's okay. Um, it brought me to my knees in a new way. It, ha it brought me to prayer in a new way. I was literally on my knees with Jesus calling with like one contact in every morning, just trying to get my mind right. I'd say Philip on the good news before the hard news. But he showed up for me in a way that was awesome. And it allowed me, what he allowed for me in that time was the daily habit of being on my knees in the word of God, in Jesus calling to get me through a season that started with me going ahead of his instructions. Leaving there meant that I was leaving those early mornings and leaving a desperate physical situation because I was exhausted. But it didn't leave behind my desire to kind of control my circumstances and not surrender to God all of it. Like I literally got home and I was like, I've got this now. And I'm like, that's the problem. You don't. Not, not in the office and not at home. And so I almost had a different set of rules for like mothering at home and being at home than I did um, for work. I was like, well, I should have surrendered it all to God, but as soon as I got everything at home, I tried to reclaim it again. And God was like, no, I am not asking you to have it all and hold it all and do it all. I'm really not. When I left Fox, I thought I had given up on that life. I'm giving up on this. I can't do it. I can't, I'm not going to bed early enough. I'm not. I'm trusting myself to study enough. I'm not the mom I want to be right now. I'm not the wife I want to be right now. I give up. And I thought that was enough. I literally thought that giving up on that job of broadcasting dreams was enough to bring my heart where it needed to be, but it wasn't. It required giving it over. And so I was like, God, isn't it enough? I just gave up. And he's like, mm-mm. And it wasn't until I was home and still meeting failure at home that I realized, well, I haven't given this over to you. I haven't given my will over to you. I haven't given my heart over to you completely. I give up, I give up on all that stuff, but it didn't matter because I haven't given it over to you. And until I give you complete control of my heart, like God, it's okay if things go wrong. Like, what do you want for me today? I wasn't giving it over to him, which means like when you hand it over to him, like he's holding you. When you give it up, you just let go. It's a big difference. And I, I can only describe it in the moment of failure after I thought I had done all that I needed to do and giving up all the stuff that I thought was holding me back. But it wasn't about giving it up, it was giving, about giving it over to God. I'm so thankful for Jesus Calling. I'm like, Jesus Calling provided me that friend who was like, this is what God's saying you today. Exactly today, this is what you need. And then here's where you're gonna open up in your Bible. It was just like, it was like that friend who is saying like, this is what God's speaking over you today. And I know this is what you're saying. It was like this, your very best friend, um, anointed by God, who is there specifically to like point your eyes to him. And I think it was, it was just this gentle, awesome, generous gift of a friend early in the morning that could just point my eyes. And it always seemed to be just right. It just, it just always seemed to be just right. Like I'd oftentimes, like I'd say to Tim, I'm like, I mean, does Sarah Young know? Like, does Sarah know that I'm leaving work tomorrow? Does she know that tomorrow's the day I have to say goodbye to everybody at Fox on December 21st is the day before my tomorrow? And tomorrow, I felt so carried in the Holy Spirit on that day that I said goodbye to my team at Fox and that I couldn't continue to do and be the teammate that they needed. And that was really hard. And the day before, I was filled with worry and filled with what ifs. Like, is this the right decision? Is this the right path you have me on, God? And I opened it up and it was exactly about that. 
and it says, my plan for your life is unfolding before you. Sometimes the road you are traveling seems blocked or it opens up so painfully slowly that you must hold yourself back. Then when the time is right, the way before you suddenly clears through no effort of your own. What you have longed for and worked for, I present to you freely as pure gift. You feel awed by the ease with which I operate in the world and you glimpse my power and my glory. Do not fear your weakness for it is a stage on which my power and glory perform most brilliantly. As you persevere along the path I have prepared for you, depending on my strength to sustain you, expect to see miracles and you will. It was like, is she here? <laughs> Sarah, are you here? <laughs> but I tell you what, God has used her and I, t I meet so many people who have been like, you know what, I felt that way too. There's something that is so special about that conversation. You wanna talk about a conversation, that's it. Like Jesus calling is exactly that. And it's that trusted heart of a friend who's like, I know you're saying this and this is what I say to you. And it's with that voice of God that like, you might not have allowed yourself to like hear and then flooded, you're just right there flooded with three scriptures that are, you're just gonna soak in those, three or four of them, and then you carry those with you the rest of the day and those carry you. I mean, it just was, I don't think that I could have gotten through that season without just the daily on my knees in the dark with the light of my phone or flashlight on Jesus Calling. I don't. It was a huge gift to me. I'm having a hard time keeping myself together during this because, you know, I really felt like guilty for leaving something so good. You know, I had like the best team. And when I read, I present to you freely as pure gift, I'm like, God, you're giving me an opportunity to thank everybody and go, and that's okay. It was just permission to be fully weak and say, I can't do this anymore. Um, but that very day of admitting that I can't do this anymore was a day where I felt so much of his love and power um, and permission um, just to glorify him in that process. So this was, it just allowed me to fully prepare for what the next day held. And um, there were so, I, I can say this about December 21st, but I could say it about so many other pages in this devotional because I just think it's, it's blessed to be a blessing. And I experienced that and I'm so thankful for that. In TV, we talk about there's a white balance. So like you'll, you'll hold a piece of white paper up to a camera and all the other colors and light are balanced off that for the rest of your film shoot. And for me, um, the word of God has always been a white balance for me. And Jesus Calling just gave me that like friend to wake up in the middle of the night and read God's word in a conversational way. Um, and it was my white balance. All that other news, everything else just came off of that. You know, things that should have been more extreme didn't feel as extreme. You know, something I could have felt in a way that maybe God didn't want me to feel it didn't get there because I had my white balance. Everything was set against the word. Um, and I'm really thankful for that, particularly in a, in a year of really hard news. Um, it was hard, hard news. And so I wasn't particularly great at compartmentalizing that. And um, I don't know what would have happened to me if you know, I wasn't in the Word during that time. I still struggle with like guilt or the where am I supposed to be? You know, I'm here, but I'm supposed to be there. Um, I get asked a lot, like, how did you balance it all? I didn't. How do you balance it all now? I don't. Um, my work looks different now. It might be working from home and it might be traveling a little bit now and it might be writing, it might be speaking. It might not look like broadcasting right now or a television hosting right now, but we're all working on something that God's given us like gifts for. And God wants you. He created us as like working, living beings that are supposed to be doing and using the gifts that he gave us. Now, I think that there's a lie and the lie is guilt and the lie is shame and I struggle with that. And the enemy knows exactly where to get me. He knows to get me where you're not a good enough friend or a good enough wife or a good enough mother because you're over there doing that thing. Isn't that so selfish of you? Don't you feel bad you just missed that? Like that fear of letting people down. The enemy knows exactly where to get you and so, and he knows where to get me. And 
scripture says, for I do not give you a spirit of fear, or I do not give you a spirit of guilt or shame. That's not of God. So anytime you hear it, like what I've learned to do is be like, that's not God. That's not God. In Jesus' name, I pray like that out of me. I'm just doing the best I can as a mom. I'm just doing the best I can as a wife. So like all that guilt and all that shame, listen, you know where that's coming from. Identify where it comes from because it'll take you off the track that God wants you. God wants you exactly in that work spot that you're in and feel passionate about to minister to the hearts around you and to be the friend and well-watered woman for the girl next to you. He wants you there. And he'll give you invitations to, to leave when it's time, but the invitations to be where you are are real. And so I would say, feel empowered to be where you are by the Holy Spirit. And anytime you feel guilty, identify where that's coming from. But don't be afraid to reevaluate. Like, is this working for the whole? You know, and um, I'm thankful for a husband and a family that like supported my desires to do um, the things that I was doing at the time and still do now. Your struggles are okay and that God's gonna use them. Um, and that rejection is real, and it's okay to feel hurt in it, but like God redeems it. Um, I hope that you can see a little of that in there. Um, and I hope women feel too empowered to like shift gears. You know, sometimes I think we don't, we're, we kind of like su sustain and like work through things really well. Like we're tough, you know, men are too. And I think that the best thing that I've learned along the way just in work is that Sometimes there's this season and you have to find your role on the team. And so it's okay to um, have a season where you're going really hard and like you can work in this hour of the day and then you can have a season where you feel like, you know what, I need a different kind of setup. And so I think the lesson was you can leave your circumstances and they might be hard, but and it, it might change things for you a little bit technically or logistically, but it doesn't change your heart. You can find Elizabeth Hasselbeck's book, Point of View, at your favorite bookseller today. Next time on Jesus Calling Stories of Faith, we speak with rodeo star and broadcaster Anthony Lucia. Anthony started performing in rodeos at a very young age with his dad, who was also a rodeo star. Anthony shares about the complicated and sometimes difficult reality of living in the shadow of his father and his path to recognizing how God used his father to help shape him to become uniquely who he was meant to be. There was times that I, when I was young, I wanted to make my own path. I wanted to, I want to be Anthony Lucia. I don't want to be Tommy's boy, which hurts my heart to say that because I was so blessed. I still am so blessed to have my dad. And now I take so much pride when somebody goes, are you Tommy Lucia's son? Yes. Thank you for watching Jesus Calling Stories of Faith. To learn more about how to keep up with our shows bi-monthly and to listen to our weekly podcast, please visit youtube.com slash Jesus Calling Book to view and hear previous episodes and to watch a short informational video about how to access all things Jesus Calling on audio and video formats. Plus, learn how to subscribe to our podcast and video channels. Your subscription helps get the word out to more people who will benefit from these inspirational stories of faith.